This week on Waterways, collecting prey-based fish in South Florida, and biking the glades. The great web of life. Everything's connected. People eat fish. Fish eat the little fish. The little fish eat algae and corals. When scientists want to learn more about a particular species, they attempt to understand the species' predators and its food source. That's part of the reason scientists from Tavernier's Audubon Science Center are studying prey-based fish in Florida Bay. Jerry Lorenz started this project uh, about 13 years ago, 13 to 15 years ago. Um, there was a real need to monitor the prey-based fish communities of northeastern Florida Bay. Uh, not much was known about them. It's very important to know what these fish are doing up there because they're such a, a critical component of the, of the diet for the roseate spoonbill and for other wading birds. Wading birds such as the roseate spoonbill and herons, have been displaced in South Florida. Dredge and fill operations that have created extensive canal systems have diverted fresh water from its historic course. Science is now grappling to understand how this change in water flow has affected the web of life in South Florida. We left from Tavernier and uh, where our boat was docked and we cruised across uh, Florida Bay and now we're entering up into the creeks which take us up into Joe Bay and then we'll, we'll head just north of Joe Bay into the, the little wetland area where, our, where my site is located. And these sites are located in the, uh, the protected crocodiles zones of Everglades National Park. So it's closed off to public access. Um, we have permits that allow us to get back in here um, and do our research. Because of the drastic changes in hydrology from wet season to dry season, Dave Green monitors the prey-based fish populations throughout the entire year. Dave and his colleague, Dr. Jerry Lorenz, hope to measure the effect that fluctuating water levels, salinity, and temperature have on this fish community. With this data, they expect to better understand the impact that water management in South Florida has on the entire ecosystem. We have five sites that we've been studying for the past 13 or so years. Uh, we recently added two more sites. The farthest west we work in is an area just west of Flamingo called Bear Lake. Our next site east would be Taylor River, which is at the, uh, it's kind of at the headwaters of the Taylor Slough. Next in line would be Joe Bay, and then I have a site at Highway Creek. Uh, and then the other site is my Barn Sound site, which is uh, just southwest of the Card Sound Bridge. Um, and then our two new sites, uh, we have one site in Card Sound, just north of the Card Sound Bridge, and then another site at the, in Manatee Bay uh, near the outfall of the C-111 Canal. The location for these sites were chosen based upon the flight radius of the neighboring roseate spoonbill populations. All seven sites are actual feeding grounds of the roseate spoonbill. In the wet season, the fish are dispersed over the entire landscape. In the dry season, my fish are, are concentrated into smaller areas. And as the water level is falling and these fish become more and more concentrated, they, these fish are also becoming abundant and available to the wading birds, to the spoonbill. Um, you can have a lot of fish, but if the water level is too deep, the, the spoonbill is not going to be able to feed on it. So it needs this, this nice steady decline in water level so that it has ample food resource throughout its nesting period. We don't want just a, a drop off in, from a, a super high water level to a super low because then the spoonbill will never be able to, to feed. And that's, so it needs a nice steady gradual drop down. The cycle begins in June when water levels begin to rise. Water levels typically climb throughout the summer and peak in late September or early October. Water levels decline through October and November culminating in dry season conditions from February through April and early May. Right now you can see there's plenty of water. The, this means the fish are dispersed everywhere on these flats. Um, and then as, they dry, as these flats become dry, 
the fish are forced into small pools of water that are left over on these flats or into the deeper creeks. At this time in early October, the sample sites are flooded with water. There are three sample points at each site where the prey based fish will be caught. These three sample points represent different habitats, from deep water creeks to shallow flats. So in order to sample these flats areas, we don't want to disturb the sediment and, uh, and create permanent fish habitats. So what we've come up with is this removable walkway system where I can float them out to support where they can rest while I can work out on the flats. By using the removable walkway system, the habitat stability is maintained. Otherwise, deep trenches would be created by footprints, which would eventually lead to deeper trenches and a permanent hideout for fish. After almost two hours of travel, Dave is finally ready to set up his first net. The actual net was developed by Jerry Lorenz, and it's a, it's a drop-down net. It samples an area of nine square meters, and uh, it's very useful for sampling in this dwarf mangrove ecosystem. We can sample within the prop roots of the actual tree, which typically creates problems for fish sampling. As Dave has set up his first net, the fish below have all but vanished fleeing from this strange intruder. Therefore, Dave must wait a full day to return and collect his fish. What we do is we set the, the nets up 24 hours before we're actually going to sample them. So I come out a day ahead of time and set up all the nets. And then on, uh, on the second day, I will come out at sunrise and uh, I need to get all my nets in the water within three hours after sunrise. Uh, there's less shadows from the angle of the sun at that time, so the fish are less spooked by shadows from these frames. Um, so the fish are not really spooked by when I set the nets up because the nets will be rolled up and stored overnight. We're back at net 12, which is one of the flats nets uh, that we set up yesterday. Um, we're back 24 hours later, and as you can see, our, our drawstrings are out about 20 feet from the net so that I can pick them up here and, and not splash out and not uh, spook the fish in any way. And I'll be waiting, after I grab the strings, I'll wait about five minutes so that the fish can acclimate themselves to any shadow that I may have caused pull on the strings and the net will, will drop down. In order to sample the trapped fish in the net, Dave must administer a substance that will stun the fish so that they will float to the surface. This way, he can use a dip net to collect them. So it looks like we got a couple Cyprinidon variegatus, uh, sheep's head minnow, it's a common name. And then buried in this little mud right here is a Leucania parva, uh, which is a rainwater killifish. Some fish, sensing the danger from the net dropping, burrow themselves into the sediment. So Dave gently rakes around the crop roots which bring them to the surface. Then Dave bags and tags the specimens before moving on to the second sample site. Seven different study sites. Nine nets sampling three different microhabitats at each of these sites. Three days at each site. Quite a bit of work for one person, but the job is not complete. The specimens must now be examined. We're leaving Joe Bay now after a successful dry season sample. Uh, got a few fish today, and uh, we'll head back to the lab to 
take a look at what exactly we got, and which species were out there, and uh, we look forward to coming back in the in the dry season when the water level's a little bit lower and chances will be better that we'll catch uh, quite a few more fish out there at our nets. So back here in the lab, I have to uh, identify the fish we just caught in our nets and I need to uh, sort them by species and then measure their lengths and their, uh, and their weights so that we can get abundance and biomass estimates. In addition to the actual numbers of fish we have per meter squared, it's also important for us to determine the grams of fish per meter squared. Uh, because this is, after all, the, what the spoonbills are feeding on, so it's important to know the, the biomass of fish that is available uh, for the birds. In the dry season, Dave Green's sample sites look much different. In fact, in many places that Dave once easily paddled his boat, he now has to drag it over the mud. Well, we're out here today in the middle of the dry season. We still have a couple more months to go until we reach the end of the dry season. But as you can see, the flats are completely dry now. The water has dropped significantly. And it's dropped to the point where I can't even set up a net because there's no water for, or fish to sample. But this is a great indication of what happens in the dry season. The water level will drop off gradually, forcing the fish into the deep water creeks. Historically, large volumes of fresh water from the Everglades reached Florida Bay in the form of overland sheet flow. The changes from wet season to dry season would be gradual. However, with humans controlling water flow, the changes between wet and dry have been more dramatic. What effects this is having on prey-based fish and wading birds is unknown, but the picture is coming into focus. Uh, we have other researchers in the lab that that are out on these keys daily looking at the at the nests and uh, counting the chicks and counting how many chicks have hatched and survived and then uh, we're able to determine the success rate of these of the spoonbills for that season so you couple that with the uh, with the fish that I collect per square meter and uh, we can collect some pretty uh, pretty powerful data to suggest why or why not the spoonbills are, are, are successful that year by correlating data on wading birds and spoonbills with the data collected by Dave Green, Jerry Lorenz and the Audubon Science Center hope to influence decisions made about water flow in South Florida. The commitment and efforts made by these individuals has already paid off, but now it's time for others to listen. If the results of their data are ignored, the big loser could be an entire ecosystem. My fish, although they seemingly unimportant in size, are actually quite important when you, when you relate them into the entire food web of the Everglades. Something special about the Everglades, and uh, I guess I just have that inside me that I feel it every time I go out there, that I just, I need to do something to help it. And uh, the way I'm able to help it is, is through uh, protecting the, the resources that uh, the roseate spoonbill needs to survive. Exploring Everglades National Park can be quite an adventure. With a total area of over 1.5 million acres, the park is home to an incredible diversity of habitats sawgrass prairies, cypress swamps, pine lands, and hardwood hammocks, as well as shallow bays and estuaries. This is a place where temperate meets tropical, fresh water meets salt water, and animals take refuge. Most visitors only get a quick glimpse of the grandeur. 
And then again, there are ways to see more. Biking Old Roads in Everglades National Park is a fabulous way to go deeper into the River of Grass. The reason there are roads here is because this area used to be logged up until Everglades National Park was set aside in 1947. We still maintain these roads uh, because today they're used as fire access roads for our park firefighters and the prescribed fire program. To get to the biking trails in Everglades National Park, you must drive. When you reach the park's main entrance, be sure to ask for biking trail guides. The maps and brochures can give you a quick introduction to the history and ecology of the areas, as well as keep you from making wrong turns. One of the most spectacular trails at Everglades is the Pinelands Hiking and Bike Trail. To get there, take the main park road for six miles and then turn left at the road to Long Pine Key Campground. We're at Long Pine Key Campground right now. This is about six miles from the main park entrance. And there's also a picnic area at the campground and it's the best place to park for going biking in the Pinelands. Um, you'll park here, there are restrooms here, and ride your bike a little ways back up the road to gate four. And that's where you start the Long Pine Key biking trail. If you decide to park at the entrance to the trail, do not block the gate. Emergency access to the area may be necessary, so avoid blocking the entrance. We're here at the trailhead of the Long Pine Key Nature Trail in the Pinelands habitat of Everglades National Park. It goes through mainly the pine forest habitat of the Everglades, but you'll also go through finger glades and past hammocks. It's about six miles one way, and you can ride your bike back along the main road or back along the Long Pine Key Nature Trail. The Pinelands are the most diverse habitat in the park, consisting of open pine forests with saw palmetto and over 200 species of subtropical plants. We're in the South Florida Pine Rocklands right now. Um, this is the highest and driest community in Everglades National Park, and it's also one of the most endangered habitats in the Everglades and in South Florida. The pine trees grow on the higher elevation areas, uh, specifically along the Atlantic Coastal Ridge, which stretches up through Miami and up into Fort Lauderdale. And most of the areas that used to have pine trees now have houses and malls and just development, human development. Everglades National Park is home to a rich and varied flora, more than 1,000 species of seed-bearing plants, and the more primitive and simply constructed groups, such as ferns, mosses, and lichens. Right now we're in a finger glade. This is one of the habitats you can see along the Long Pine Key Nature Trail. A glade is a grassy opening, and these are called finger glades because they extend like fingers in between the pine forest areas. Um, it's an area where there's slightly lower elevation, so for a good part of the year, this area might be flooded. But even during the dry season, there might be areas that are slightly deeper in the finger glade that retain water all year round and this is a good place to look for grazing deer and other types of animals. What you can see behind me is a hammock habitat. It's the area where the vegetation suddenly looks a lot denser. There's some broadleaf trees back there between the pine trees. Um, a hammock is a tree island of mostly tropical trees and you can see several hammocks along the Long Pine Key biking trail. The weather conditions for biking are almost always perfect. In the winter, temperatures range from a low of 53 to a high of 77. It's a little warmer in the summer with a low of 67 to a high of 87. Well, I mean, I'm overweight and out of shape, but uh, riding through the Pinelands is pretty, uh, pretty much of a breeze here. It's perfectly level, and if I get tired, I can just stop, get off the bike, and look around. I mean, there's plenty to look at. While mountain bikes are recommended, there are no hills or mountains. There may be mud, though, with the highest elevation being 8 feet above sea level. We're here at the end of the Long Pine Key Nature Trail. You can get back to the Long Pine Key Campground either along the trail or back along the main road. If you do go along the road, be careful because the speed limit gets up to 55 miles per hour. While the Long Pine Key Nature Trail is a bike enthusiast's favorite, many sections are not suitable in the summer months due to flooding. However, the Old Ingram Highway is a great summer alternative and has year-round access.
To get there from the main park entrance, turn left at Royal Palm Road and a right at the first street. When the road forks, be sure to follow the dirt road to the Old Ingram Highway. Again, be sure not to block the gate with your car. We're here at gate 15 at the start of the Old Ingram Highway. It's 11 miles one way. There's a couple campsites along the way. You can get a backcountry permit at the entrance station. Um, it's a nice trail to bike along. You can see a lot of wildlife and because it's elevated, um, it's a good place to go biking when the waters are high during the summer. The Old Ingram Highway was um, built in 1914. It's the original road of the park and actually the famous Anhinga Trail travels along part of the Old Ingram Highway. The reason the Anhinga Trail is so popular is because of its wildlife and a lot of the same wildlife you can see here on the Old Ingram Highway. There's a canal all along the road. It's a good place to look for alligators and birds. And the trail also goes through several different types of habitat. Uh, the canal goes all along the trail and you'll also see wide open areas of sawgrass, cypress stones, and it's a good place to see wildlife. For those bikers who are also animal lovers, the canal paralleling the trail is a prime feeding area for wading birds. And if you feel inspired and adventurous, you can hike off the trail and explore the cypress domes that dot the landscape. Is there anything we should look out for? Watch out for snakes and poison wood and watch your step. Alright. So if you just bike along Old Ingham Highway, you're missing a, a, a great opportunity to get off your bike, get out into the sawgrass, take some hikes, get into the domes, and explore. The whole thing's open to you. If you stray from the trail, don't go too far. When you explore the Everglades, you're part of the food chain and alligators are abundant. Be assured, however, that they're just as afraid of you as you are of them. It also helps if you learn to recognize and avoid poisonous plants. One plant you want to be especially careful of in the Everglades is poison wood. It grows all along the Old Ingram Highway. But fortunately, there are a couple easy identification markers you can learn. Um, poison wood is a relative of poison ivy. And like poison ivy, if you touch any part of it, the leaves, the bark, you come down with a nasty reaction, an itching rash. Um, to identify poison wood, um, you'll notice that most of the leaves are in leaflets of five. Um, many of the leaves, especially the older leaves, have spots on the leaves. And also, the leaves have a yellow midrib down the center and a yellow margin around the edge. To even a seasoned visitor, Everglades National Park offers a never-ending opportunity to explore. With the largest continuous stand of sawgrass prairie in North America, as a home to 14 endangered and 9 threatened species, as the largest protected mangrove ecosystem in the Western Hemisphere, and as the largest designated wilderness east of the Mississippi, visitors are always blessed with glimpses of the glories of the natural world. And on a bike, it can be even better. <laughs>